Interesting. We learn a lesson here how one doctrine after another fits like a glove. If it doesn't, it stands out like a sore thumb. There's something wrong with your interpretation. The final seven years of the Mosaic Law dispensation. The Jews. Intercalation. 483 years. Stop. Church. 2,000 years. Now. Begin again. Finish the final seven years of the Mosaic Law dispensation. And we're looking at a summary now, what we just looked at in the previous broadcast. A summary of the facts. Ray, the 70 weeks prophecy of Daniel's 9. We get dispensation of the church and Israel, and we have to combine these doctrines and make sure that we're interpreting them all correctly. And it's just simply a matter of, are you reading them properly? The examination of the 70 weeks prophecy of Daniel has produced several significant facts. First, the Daniel 9, 24 to 27 prophecy involves 70 weeks, 490 years of time. I guess you're tired of hearing that, but you're going to recall this, and then people are going to go through all over, go all over prophecy, make up their own history, cherry picking everything. You'll have your ducks in a row. Second, God determined all 70 weeks or 490 years specifically for Israel and Jerusalem, not for the church. Third, the first 69 weeks or 483 years have ended with Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem on the fall of a donkey on Palm Sunday. Fourth, the church did not exist during any part of the first 69 weeks or 483 years. A lot of people say, oh, yeah, it did. All the way back to Adam and Eve. Oh, boy. Read it properly. Sixth, God started the church very shortly after he interrupted his 70 weeks program for Israel and Jerusalem with a gap of time at the end of the first 69 weeks, nearly 2,000 years ago. Strong inferences. Ray Daniel's 70 weeks prophecy and the presence of the church on earth. <clears throat> Shower includes in his book, these six facts when taken together and combined with distinction between Israel and the church, note at the beginning of this chapter prompted three strong inferences. Here's a study I did on the church versus Israel. And it just graphs it down or compares one to the other, especially relative to the different purposes, similar but not the same. We can move to that later. God does not intend the church to be present on the earth for any part of the 70 weeks or 490 years he has de determined specifically for Israel and Jerusalem. <clears throat> he does not intend this. He intends to keep the 70 weeks program for Israel alone in Jerusalem and his program for the church separate and distinct from each other, just as Israel and the church are distinct entities. This does not mean that God stopped working together with Israel and Jerusalem when he interrupted the 70 weeks program and started the church. Instead, it means that God temporarily stopped one specific program, the 70 weeks program, with Israel and Jerusalem while he works his program with the church in the world. There is a major difference between saying that God has stopped working with Israel altogether and saying that he temporarily stopped one specific program with that nation. God worked with Israel and Jerusalem in ways other than the 70 weeks program for many centuries before he started that specific program after Daniel's time. In like manner, during the present interruption of the 70 weeks program, he works with the nation and city in ways other than that program. God intends the church to be present on the earth specifically during the interrupting gap of time in the inter intercalation period between the end of the first 69 weeks or 483 years and the beginning of the 70th week or last seven years. God intends the church to be present there, as we said. So, if God intended to mix any part of the 70 weeks program for Israel and Jerusalem with his program for the church, why didn't he start the church during the first 69 weeks of the 70 weeks program? First of all, God will remove the church from the earth before the 70th week begins with the resumption of his 70 weeks program for Israel and Jerusalem. We'll a study on that in the rapture. Okay. The church is absent on earth in passages referring to the seven year tribulation period, Daniel's 70th week. So, a seventh a seventh inference for the pre-tribulation rapture of the church is gained from an examination of the references to the church and Israel in the book of the Revelation. 
references to the church in Revelation only occur before the seven-year tribulation period. Showers continues. 24 verses in the book of the Revelation refer to the church. 19 of these verses refer to the church as the church or churches, ecclesia. Two verses refer to it as the bride. Two verses indicate that the church is the lamb's wife. And one verse refers to the church as both the bride and the wife of the lamb. Revelation never refers to the church as the body. 20 of the 24 verses refer to the church in the present church age. Two verses refer to the church in the marriage of the Lamb, which will take place in heaven, not on earth, to the church. Two verses refer to the church in the future eternal state. It is important to note that there are not references to the church on the earth in chapters 4 through 18, the chapters relating specifically to the 70th week of Daniel 9, including the seals and trumpets and bowls. References to Israel in the book of the Revelation declare that the predominance of Israel during the Daniel's 70th week and magnify the absence of the church during that seven-year tribulation period. Look at the evidence. 22 verses in the book of Revelation refer to Israel. One of these verses refers to Israel as the 12 tribes, tribes of the 12 of the tr children of Israel. 21, Revelation 21, 12. 10 verses refer to the 144,000 Jewish men by several designations. And 10 verses describe Israel through various forms as a woman, woman who is pursued by the dragon, Satan. One verse refers to the children of Israel. So, one of the 22 verses refers to Israel in Old Testament times. One other refers to the nation in the future eternal state. And four refer to Israel during the time of the first coming of Christ. It is important to note that the remaining 16 verses refer to Israel on the earth during the 70th week. Furthermore, the sacrificial system in the tribulation temple will be an ongoing practice at that time. Real sacrifices pointing to a resumption of the rule of the law of Moses. So, is the church present? Evidently not. Saints will be present on earth during Daniel's 70th week, however, but they will not be church saints. Remember this, not all saints are church saints. The book of the Revelation clearly indicates that saints will be present on the earth during the 70th week. For example, Revelation teaches that the Antichrist will wage war against the saints during the 70th week, and that many saints of that period will be martyred. This teaching prompts the following question. Doesn't the fact that saints will be present on the earth during the 70th week require the conclusion that the church will be present on the earth during the seventh week, 70th week? The answer to that question is no. The fact that saints will be present on the earth during the 70th week does not require that conclusion because not all saints are church saints. The answer is based on two factors. First, the Bible clearly teaches that there were saints on the earth in Old Testament times. For example, Psalm 16.3 referred to the saints who were in the earth, and Psalm 116.15 declared that the death of God's saints is precious in his sight. Second, the church did not begin historically until the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 after the death and ascension of Christ. So, take a look at this study. Inception of the church. Okay. Since the church did not begin until that time, the saints who lived and died before the day of Pentecost did not belong to the church. They were Old Testament saints, not church saints. Thus, there was an extensive period of history before, prior to the, prior to the birth of the church, when saints were not church saints. Okay. Moving on. The saints on earth during Daniel's 70th week are not church saints. The fact that saints in the Old Testament were not church saints prompted several conclusions. First, not all saints in the church are church saints. Second, since the Bible refers to saints who are not church saints, the fact that the saints will be present on the earth during the 70th week does not require the conclusion that they will be church saints. They can be designated as 70th week or tribulation saints. Third, since we are not required, we are not required to conclude that the saints present, present on the earth during the seventh week are church saints. We are not required to conclude that the church will be present on the earth during the seventieth week. Finally, since the church is raptured before the tribulation begins, we have that here. Studies on the rapture. See how everything coordinates. Then we can conclude 
that the saints on earth during the tribulation, Daniel's 70th week, are not church saints, but tribulation saints, as part of the group of saints of the Mosaic Law period. The great multitude of Revelation chapter 7, the great multitude of Revelation chapter 7, are not church saints. Introduction. Showers concludes. Between the sixth and seventh seals, John saw a great multitude of redeemed people from all nations and kindreds and peoples and tongues standing before the throne of God and before the Lamb in heaven. Revelation 9, 7, 7 9 to 17. After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. <clears throat> And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen, praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength to be our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders asked me, These in white robes, who are they? And where do they come from? And I answered, Sir, you know, and he said, They are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will spread his tent over them. Never again will they hunger, never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat upon them, nor any scorching heat. Nor the, for the Lamb at the, at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. So being clothed in white robes and holding palms does not demand a physical resurrection body, and thus point to the raptured church saints. Two necessary questions are made in the here. The two questions must be asked concerning this great multitude. First, does the fact that they were clothed in white robes and held palms in their hands require the conclusion that they are resurrected with literal physical resurrection bodies? Luke 24, 36 to 43. Many interpret it that way. Second, if they are resurrected, since the rapture of the church will involve the resurrection of church saints' bodies, is this great multitude the church, having just been raptured from the earth, be between the sixth and seventh seals of the 70th week? If it is, if it is the church, having just been raptured between the sixth and seventh seals, it would mean that the church will be on the earth through the first six seals of the 70th week. That doesn't fit, see? The answer to the first question, the fact that these people were clothed in white robes and held palms in their hands does not require the conclusion that they are resurrected with literal physical resurrection bodies. There are several reasons for this answer. First, when Christ broke the fifth seal, John saw under the altar in heaven the souls of saints who had been slain for the word of God during the 70th week. Since they had been slain, they were without physical bodies, and yet they were given white robes to wear. Thus, in Revelation, the wearing of a white robe did not require a resurrection body. Even bodiless souls can wear such a robe. Second, when the rich man of Luke 16, the rich man in Lazarus, dies, his body was buried, and his soul went to Hades. Even though his soul was without its body, Jesus described eyes and a tongue and to a bodiless soul. Third, angels and are spirit beings. As a result, by nature, they do not have a physical body. Paul put angels in a different category from those beings who have flesh and blood bodies. In Luke 24:39, Jesus stated that a spirit does not have flesh and bones such as he had in his resurrected body. In spite of the fact that angels do not have physical bodies by nature, the Bible ascribes wings, faces, feet, and hands to them and portrays them wearing clothing. Fourth, God is a spirit. As a result, by nature, he does not have a physical body. In spite of that fact, the Bible ascribes to him a head and hair, eyes and a face, an arm, hands, feet, and a finger, and portrays him wearing clothing. All four of these reasons indicate the same truth. Although the Bible ascribes such things as hands, feet, faces, tongues, and the wearing of clothing to human, angelic, and divine beings, <clears throat> it does not mean that those beings have literal, physical bodies such as resurrected people have. Since this is true, the fact that the people of the great multitude of Revelation 7 were clothed in white robes and held palms in their hands does not require the conclusion that they are resurrected with literal physical resurrection bodies. Does he prove out his case or not? Yes. This answer to the second question. The answer is twofold. We'll get to this next time.